So that's ferrets. Again, you know, animals, you can do invasive studies and really do the strong manipulation to get do a strong test of a causal role, and this is a classic example. Of course, we can't rewire humans, or we could, but it wouldn't be nice. Um, but really, we want to know, how does all that stuff get wired up? Are these regions also, is their function determined by their connectivity present at birth? Okay. Okay. Um, and due to the experience that those regions have. Okay, well, um, we can't do controlled rearing studies in humans. We can't rewire their brains. But we can be clever and smart and think of other cases. So here's an important test case. The important test case is the case of reading. Okay, why reading? Well, one, we all spend a lot of time doing it. Okay, and two, Humans have only been reading for a few thousand years. And that's not long enough for natural selection to have crafted an innately specified circuit just for reading. So that means that if we did find a patch of cortex that responds selectively to visually presented words or letters, that would suggest that for that case at least, experience was sufficient to wire up, to, to determine the function of that region of cortex. Okay, this is all very hypothetical. Everybody got the idea? Okay. Now notice this does not apply to hearing words. People have been hearing words for hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps millions. And so that's plenty of time for special pur purpose circuitry. And that special purpose circuitry uh, exists and we'll talk about it in a month or so. But now we're talking about the case of visual word recognition, this recent cultural invention of humans. Okay, so that's why it's a special case, because we know that's too recent to be innate. And so if we find a selectivity, it can't be innate. All right? So, um, that's what I just said. So, do we have such a thing? Well, how would you, how would you test for it? What would you do? Joseph, what would you do? <coughs> I guess I would show them words and then show them not words. Yeah. It's like, like, not rocket science, guys. We just keep doing the same damn thing. Exactly. Right. Um, so, start by, here's what we did. We showed people visually presented words like that, and we showed them line drawings of objects. Okay? And when we did that, we found that in most subjects, there's a tiny little patch of the bottom of their left hemisphere, right near the zones we've been talking about, near face selective and other regions, on the bottom of the brain, but that tiny little patch responds significantly more to um, words than pictures. Okay. Now, we won't do this now, but you can do it as a thought experiment. What are the alternative accounts of that activation? Has this shown that that region is selectively involved in reading? Of course not. There's a million differences between, oh, come on these and those. You know, how bright they are, how big they are, there's like a million differences, right? And so to get serious about it, we have to do the same game that we've been playing all along in this course. This is like a first whack at it. You find something, now we have a candidate. But if we want to get serious, we've got to test some other conditions to see if that's really for real, okay? All right, so here's what we did in my lab when we did this a while back. So first of all, this is, um, this is left out data. Once you find that region, remember, it's, if you're trying to characterize the function of a region, I talked briefly about this, a good way to do it is to run a localizer to find that region in each subject. Now we found it, now we have those voxels. Now we collect some new data that may be a lot like our localizer, it doesn't matter. We collect some new data and we look at the response, okay? And that just puts us on stronger statistical footing. Okay, so here is time going this way. This is something called an event-related design where you just present a single stimulus and then wait and another stimulus rather than a whole bunch of them mushed together in a block, okay? And then you average over many, many repetitions. And so this is the response over time, it's seconds, it's really slow, um, to words and line drawings in that region. Okay, so this is just replicating what I showed you before. It's showing you what the actual selectivity looks like in the real data, not just a, a significance map, okay? Why is this thing um, taking six seconds to respond? This is stimulus onset out there. Um, that's like the time between like blood flow. Yeah, remember the signal we're looking at is based on blood flow. The neurons all fired right here, but it takes a while to get the blood flow to change. That's why it's delayed. Exactly. Okay. 
All right, so what else are we going to test? Well, lot, you can do lots of different things. We, we just tried lots of things. We said, OK, let's have other things that are symbols but that our subjects can't read. So we tried Chinese characters, low response. Okay. We tried digit strings, pretty low response. That's pretty remarkable because words and digit strings are pretty similar in how we use them and what they look like. So that's pretty good. Okay. Um, we tried consonant strings like this that you can't pronounce. And we got the same response. And this is important. It tells us this, this region is not a word region. right? Instead, it's something about recognizing letters. But for the purposes of the current argument, that's OK. It's still something that has no basis in human evolution. And so if we find selectivity for letters that are presumably used in the process of reading, that must have come from experience. OK? Uh, what else did we do? OK, that's what I just said. Um, now, I submit that this is a pretty good argument that that region must have been wired up by experience. But you could niggle. You could say, well, there are more kind of straight edges with the words and consonants. The digits are curvier or whatever. You could make up some story about how that isn't necessarily selective for letters and words. And therefore, maybe it's not necessarily wired up by experience. Further, who knows? Maybe everybody just has that weird selectivity in there, even if they never learn to read. Okay. So it would really be nice to make a stronger case. And what we did was we couldn't find people in Cambridge who couldn't read, who didn't have other things going on. Um, but we could find people who um, did read Hebrew. And we had, where's my Hebrew data? All right, hang on. OK, right. So here are our non-Hebrew readers. Um, <laughs> this is funny. This is an old graph. It's not so impressive looking. Um, and this is, this is, I forgot to switch out our newer data. Um, OK, so we, what we found is in people who don't read Hebrew, the response was lower to Hebrew than to words. Looks like it's almost as high, actually. When we ran more subjects, it's actually quite a bit lower. Um, nonetheless, when we ran people who read both English and Hebrew, the Hebrew response is higher. And that nails the case that it's actually that individual's experience that determines the selectivity of this region. It depends on what orthographies you know. If you know how to read Hebrew, you get a high response. If you don't, you get a lower response. Everybody get that this pretty much nails the case? OK, so where are we? All of this was to say, do we ever see selectivity in the brain that can't be innate? And I submit to you, this is selectivity in the brain that can't be innate, that has to be learned. right? And in fact, our data show that it depends on the subject's experience. Good. So yes, we have such a thing. It's called the visual word form area. 